uh, and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. So with that, uh, maybe first I'll introduce uh, our speaker. So our speaker today is Alexander Sasha Simonov. Uh, so a lot of you, those who are doing electrochemistry, uh, you should definitely uh, know about Sasha. Uh, you might be aware of the groundbreaking work he has been doing, uh, but a little bit about Sasha. He's an ARC Research Council uh, Future Fellow, and he's based at the School of Chemistry of Monash University. His research and his group is looking at designing and understanding new methods to generate and use renewable solar electricity for the sustainable chemistry technologies, in particular for water electrolysis and transformations of inorganic end compounds using the in situ spectro electrochemical methods and advanced electroanalytical techniques. Now that's a little bit of a you know, long discussion about Sasha's uh, skill set. But if you want to see those skill sets in action, I refer you to his recent nature paper that came out or some of his other earlier works, uh, his science paper on electrochemical ammonia production. So that's a, a little bit about Sasha. Now, the way we are going to run before I pass it on to Sasha is uh, if anybody has questions or anything, please feel free to put it up in the chat. And I will pick up the questions at the end of the uh, Sasha's presentation. And you also have an opportunity to just jump in uh, in order to ask the questions later on as well. So with that in mind, maybe uh, Sasha, uh, welcome to our seminar. Thank you very much, Diane, for this very kind and very detailed presentation. All right, so if you cannot hear me, please let me know because the microphone on my laptop is often misbehaving, and I'll try to put my face as close as possible to the screen, so it works fine. All right, so uh, yeah, to talk today, I've been suggested, I was very, very happy to do so, to talk about some of our work in the um, water splitting area. But to set the scene, I would just start with showing a couple of photographs of our campus and the facilities around. So if you haven't been here for a while, so definitely consider visiting us. A lot of things to see, beautiful buildings, beautiful facilities. And uh, yeah, notwithstanding the horrible weather, great place to be and to work. Um, then I think it's very important to actually provide a pretty broad overview of what we're doing here. And uh, we call it the Monash Renewable Fuels Project or the solar fuels or whatever is renewable uh, available around us, pretty much a lot of things. And this uh, pretty busy diagram shows, uh, tries to summarize what we are doing. So there is a water splitting activities where of course we want to generate hydrogen of it. There is a lot of activities currently going on around the ammonia electrosynthesis. And thanks to Diane, these <clears throat> two recent research papers, if some of you are interested, can be found using these QR codes or just on the internet. And then what we're also trying to do, we try to make use of ammonia to produce the fertilizers and uh, uh, through the direct oxidation of ammonia in the electrochemical devices and uh, photo driven um, uh, in the photo driven processes as well. So for the nitrate synthesis, for example, for the ammonia nitrate or potassium nitrate, which can be then uh, integrated into the flow systems and used, for example, on the farms directly. Um, we also, of course, invest in a lot of energy in trying to understand how the catalysts work. So using the in situ techniques, which uh, Diane has mentioned, but in the interest of time, and probably luckily for many of you, I will not talk too much of those about it because sometimes it goes in a bit too much detail and uh, not really <clears throat> clear, especially when you try to do the presentation on Zoom and you cannot wave your hands in front of the, in front of the slides on the data. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about this part of the overall picture, the water oxidation reaction and water oxidation reaction in acidic conditions. So and the first questions we need to answer, why do we actually bother about low pH? So those of you who are into the water splitting might know that, but still I would like to just provide a brief historical overview that the alkaline water electrolysis is the established technology over, uh, used in the industry for more than 100 years. So it's not a new process and it's actually been known for the 250 years, if I'm not mistaken, was discovered. and. Um, 
it's pretty well understood what the good catalysts there are. This uh, nickel iron on the anode, nickel on the cathode and its alloys. And that's how it typically operates with the current state of the art. So this is the voltage applied and the current achievable. But then we have another line here. This data taken from the Siemens um, uh, website or their, one of their uh, press releases where they show the proton exchange membrane electrolyzer, which, as you can see, of course, offers immediately a lot of advantages in terms of its performance. And uh, it allows the compact design and uh, very few gases and other important advantages like high rates of their pyrogen evolution reaction, immunity to CO2, very fast response. So everything is pretty much perfect about it, except the anode side. The anode side is highly problematic and uh, also, the nephron in the middle is, of course, expensive, but I'm not sure that this is a huge significant problem anymore with all the exciting developments in the membrane technology which have been recently achieved. But what is actually particularly problematic with the anode is that the state of that catalyst is they are all iridium based. And if we um, ask our geologist friends what iridium is, they will tell us that this is one of the most scarcest and most hard to mine elements in the earth crust and uh, probably many of it was just coming to our planet by strikes of the meteorites or so there are distant layers where there is a radium then there is no radium then another distant layer so this will probably all coming from space so if you really want to mine a radium we probably need to go to them to them to the space and and uh, find some meteorites asteroids there crack them and bring it back to there so it doesn't sound very uh, easy to achieve, so therefore we're trying to solve this. But of course, this is a highly challenging task. And the first thing you need to do, everyone needs to do before starting a task is to identify the benchmark. So there is, of course, a huge amount of literature and the PM water electrolyzer devices are well, well known to be all, already on the market and they are operating for quite significant time. But still, when you are doing experiments in the lab, you need to understand what this benchmark performance actually is. And uh, first, let's have a look at the chemistry of iridium. So on the left-hand side, I've taken the Purba diagram of iridium from the Atlas of the Electrochemical Equilibria, and uh, that's the orange line represents the boundary, the lowest thermodynamic boundary, which we need to surpass. And we need to be somewhere here to make the water being oxidized. And it seems like we are more or less in the safe zone, so iridium oxide should be stable. However, this outstanding paper published by the team of um, 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 scientist uh, Koper, Cherevko, and their colleagues, if I remember correctly, have done a very nice analysis of their different iridium-based catalysts operating in <clears throat> mild acidic environment at very low ambient temperature and at moderate potentials. And uh, when they took iridium oxide, just crystalline, highly crystalline iridium oxide, they observed continuous decay in its activity by the order of magnitude only on the time scales of uh, several minutes. Sorry, not several minutes, uh, thousands of seconds. Yes, it's dozens of minutes, so still very short. And there was not very significant but detectable amount of iridium dissolved. As soon as something more fancy and much more active was taken, like amorphous iridium oxide or, or this iridium oxide mixed, mixed with the rare earth elements, the corrosion was, of course, was found to be orders of magnitude higher. And they have concluded that this will happen all the time and uh, with each and every catalyst. So we also tried to do this in our lab, and this work was done by the, our outstanding uh, honors student, Nathan Cho, and also the PhD student, Darcy, who synthesized this uh, just regular iridium oxide, ruthenium oxide, and mixed iridium ruthenium oxide catalyst using the most classical atom exclusion method. So that's how they look under the ACM. Nothing fancy here, just robust bulk particles, which you would think should be quite stable and nicely operating. Probably not super active, but uh, you would expect them to be robust. So, of course, we've done XRD to prove that we formed what we wanted, then recorded cyclic altimetry, and it followed the expected trend. So, the least active is iridium, the most active is ruthenium, and iridium ruthenium is sitting somewhere in the middle. Um, for those of you who might not be exceptionally experienced in the electric catalysis field, I would like to emphasize that this cyclic altimetry is not the representation of the real actual initial activity of the catalyst, and you always need to do the quasi-steady state measurements. So in other words, you need to 
apply the constant potential or constant current for a decent period of time, wait for the response to stabilize, and then use data to measure your initial activity. So, and especially, of course, never use the linear sweeps because this is just an archaic technique and I don't understand why it would be used in 21st century anyway. So cyclical altimetry, just an estimate of the activity and the true activity needs to be done, needs to be measured under the steady state condition. Talking about the steady state, we took this catalyst and applied um, constant current density. In this case, it was 100 milliamps per centimeter square at ambient temperature at 80 degrees and followed the response. So, and we found that iridium oxide started to degrade immediately, but you should know that this is actually an hour time scale. So it operated a while and then was approaching, approaching close with the background uh, uh, activity of our platinized titanium support electrode, but it didn't degrade completely. And there was a significant amount of the material dissolved. At 80 degrees, the activity was lost essentially down to the background level at, uh, after around 40 hours. When we took a ruthenium, this guy just did not survive at all. So a couple of hours at the uh, 80 degrees and it's dead. At room temperature, it was a bit more active, but still, sorry, a bit more stable, but still died very, very fast. But the activity was quite nice. So we were reaching 100 milliamps per centimeter square with quite a low loading of the catalyst on the electrode surface at uh, uh, 250 millivolts uh, over potential, which is good. But the problem is that it survives only for half an hour. So that's why I'm emphasizing that it's very important to measure the stabilized activity, because if you would just measure voltammetry, you would get this wonderful response here at zero point and say, oh, I've invented the very best catalyst in the world. But the problem is that this catalyst is useless because it does not survive even two hours under the actual operating conditions. Then the mixed iridium ruthenium system was somewhere in the middle between the two guys, again, quite accept, uh, explainable. and. Uh, the outcome was always the same. None of these catalytic systems are robust enough under this uh, liquid dissolved electrolyte conditions to operate and to sustain water oxidation for the time, time periods required for the practical applications. So what we've done next, we've constructed a small uh, protein exchange membrane electrolysis device. So this is this photograph and here's the scheme. It's been published in this paper um, uh, a couple of years ago, and I strongly recommend you have a look at it if you're interested in building something similar, because it's a very simple and very versatile device, which allows uh, us just to study the actual proton exchange membrane or any other exchange uh, ion exchange membrane electrolyzers under the conditions which are much, much closer to the real application. And when we've done that, we found that ruthenium is still unstable, but it now is able to maintain its activity for hours and at one amp per centimeter squared 80 degrees in pure water. While the radium, although it was losing us a bit of activity here, we actually believe that this was due to the imperfections of our setup because this was the early work with this material rather than the actual catalyst degradation. So what is happening? Why this material is stable in acid, sorry, is entirely unstable in liquid electrolyte solution in acid, but suddenly become stable when we put it into the real electrolyzer conditions. This was also explained in literature recently by this team of researchers coming from Germany. This is an absolutely amazing work. And what they've done, they tested uh, iridium-based uh, catalyst under their different conditions. So this one represents just a regular electrochemical cell with the dissolved electrolyte solution. And this on top represents their <clears throat> Membrane, electroly ele me membrane um, um, electrolyzer without any dissolved electrolyte solution. So, and as you can see, so the stability here represented in terms of the S number. So the S number is the amount of oxygen evolved per the amount of the catalyst dissolved. In other words, the higher the S number, the more robust catalyst you have. And as you can see, the difference in the operation in the aqueous dissolved electrolyte solution conditions to the real PM device is orders of magnitude in terms of stability. So this means that this device can be stable for years, while this device will die within um, hours or at most days. So they have explained it by the differences in the pH, differences in the uh, catalyst environment, but there were still a couple of parameters, like this purple one, which remained unexplained, and there is still a lot of research needs to be done to understand why 
the conditions of their model, dissolved electrolyte solutions, as we most of us use just in the regular three electrode cells, are so much more damaging than the ones in the real device. But the general conclusion is quite clear. If one can achieve high stability in the liquid electrolyte solution, most likely the stability in the actual real PM double water electrolyzer will be absolutely amazing and great. So keeping this in mind, um, we continue to work in majorly in the liquid electrolyte solution, but still uh, now we are much, much more intensifying our activities in building electrolyzers, which I'll hopefully be able to present probably next time. So how we are going to solve the problem of the instability which still persists? To do so, we apply the, soul, the approach which, call, which we call catalyst and matrix. There is absolutely nothing groundbreaking in you here, so the concept is quite simple. So we take a thermodynamically stable and electrically conductive uh, metal oxide. For example, um, please, after work. Okay, for example, the oxides of lead, antimony, titanium, tungsten, all are known to be stable under the conditions where we want to operate them. And then we modify them either by doping or mixing or absorption with an oxygen evolution reaction additive oxide, which, of course, the first of this one is iridium. Then it can be, of course, ruthenium as well, which is most active but highly unstable. And probably much most interesting are the non noble metals like cobalt, nickel, manganese, iron, and probably others. And uh, as I just mentioned, this concept is, of course, not new. And uh, if you are into the history of electrochemistry, you should, of course, know the story, a very exciting story of success of the dimensional stable anodes and also the lead oxide, um, lead dioxide electrodes, which have been developed for a variety of applications. And probably the most famous ones are the electro winning, but there are, of course, many others. And it was, of course, explored as similarized in this wonderful review by Pletcher, Walsh, and Lee that lead oxide coatings can be doped with other elements, for example, like bismuth iron and the fluorine, and of course, cobalt is here and silver, which I'll also mention later. But I want to mention that the cobalt here said is said to be catalyzing organic degradation. But when we are talking about the catalysis of the oxygen evolution, they are saying not about the doping, but mixing of the cobalt three or four with lead oxide. And that's where we are a bit different. We want to really dope it, and I'll show you in a second, uh, show show in a minute or so why the doping works much better. So first of all, since these uh, lead oxides are being electrodeposited, we thought, okay, that's probably the easiest way to produce them. And uh, it's there is also another very famous work in the field, which I think everyone working in the water split in area knows. This was published by Conan and Nasera about the in situ formation of the oxygen evolving cobalt catalyst in the neutral, and then it was also expanded to the alkaline condition. So, if just in case you're not aware of it, the principle of operation is quite simple. If we have cobalt 2 plus in solution, either dissolve from the cobalt oxide catalyst to intentionally add it, and then we apply a positive potential to it. So according to the proper diagram, it will be, according to the thermodynamics, it will be just for depositing the electrode surface, and since it's cobalt, it's catalytically active for the water electrooxidation. However, I just mentioned the proper diagram, and if you want to operate the system in this domain of interest, low pH, even pH 2, this is definitely not going to work because the species are just thermodynamically unstable, and all of them go to the solution. And that's what you would observe in the experiment. If you decrease the pH, increase the temperature, all the cobalt oxide will get dissolved in the solution and remain there. So how can we solve it? This is where the lead comes into the story. <clears throat> if we add a bit of lead and also iron, which are all we still not fully understand, that's what's going to happen. And apply the positive potential, that's what's going to happen. So the potential, the currents will draw dramatically up. And what is most important, that on the way back, down in cyclic voltammetry, which I hope will appear now. So the currents become faster. And this means that the catalyst is continuously being deposited on the electrode, which is, of course, most obviously seen in this chrono potentiometric experiment, which shows the nicely functionalized electrode, which holds a lot of oxygen. We've characterized the material and with uh, all the methods available to us, and we've actually proven that this case, the cobalt and iron atoms actually doped into the lead sites. It's not a composite, it's actually a doped material. 
And what is good about this material is that it just maintains its efficiently, efficiency and activity indefinitely. It never ever was shown, was observed to degrade. And as you can see, we apply positive potential heat only improves in the activity. That's why I call it indefinitely. So we were just, there is just no mechanism for it to degrade. And this is the video of the electrode, which has been operating for one or two weeks. <clears throat> If we push it higher, increase the temperature, decrease the pH, it even likes it even more. And we can achieve half of ampere with a flat electrode at a normal potential of 0 0.7 volts, which is essentially unachievable with any other stable noble metal free electrode. Of course, iridium or ruthenium will be more active than that, but still they will struggle to get to this point when they're just produced in the flat morphology. They will be need to be non-structured in the forms of particles and the high surface area. However, there is always a problem. That's why there is a button in the heading. So what are we going to do with all these ions floating around in the solution? Is it actually possible to construct an electrolyzer using this system? So the worst, the first obvious problem is that if you, for example, put it into the environment of the PM water electrolyzer, these cations will happily interact with the cation exchange membrane and will increase the conductivity, decrease the concentration here, which will, be both, will both affect their performance not, very, not in a very nice way. But most importantly, they will achieve the cathode, which would typically be something like highly dispersed platinum on the carbon support with the very low loadings of platinum because its activity for the HR is just insanely high and we don't need much there. And will platinum actually like seeing these cations in its environment? So we try to understand it by just investigating a platinum electrode in the presence of the precursors of the cobalt iron lead iron catalyst. Starting with the probably least important iron, we expectedly observe the 3 plus 2 plus redox couple at these potentials, but then the hydrogen and the potential deposition on the platinum was essentially unaffected. So we were not really sure whether iron is doing anything. A much more definite answer was obtained with cobalt, which was just doing nothing and probably making platinum even a bit more cleaner through some redox mediated process probably. But when we put lead, we of course, and very expectantly observe that the platinum is dead. And uh, again, this should be known to uh, classical electrochemists because a lot of metals, well, quite a few metals undergo so-called under potential deposition, especially on the noble metal surfaces. So copper is doing this, lead is doing this, many others are doing this, and lead is particularly perfect in poison and platinum. And also, any traditional electrochemist would tell you, what do you want, what would you do if you want to kill the hydrogen evolution reaction? They would tell you, just use a lead electrode. It's horrible hydrogen evolution catalyst, and that's what we observed when we undertook the uh, potential static experiments. So when we put lead into the uh, contact with the elect platinum electrode, the current immediately goes down and um, degrades down to the microamp level. In the case of iron, the behavior was quite weird and we're not fully sure that we understand what's happening there. The initial improvement, apparent improvement in the activity is not really the activity for the hydrogen solution. This is just reduction of iron 3 plus to 2 plus, but then something else starts to happen and the activity goes down. But most importantly, when we were putting cobalt into the system, nothing happened and the system remained stable. So that's what we've used for our further work. So let's have a look how the catalyst, and we try to understand how the catalyst will behave if we start removing some of the precursors from the electrolyte solution. So that's the um, profile of the potential at the constant current density of 10 milliamps per centimeter square with all of these guys present in the acidic electrolyte solution. So as I've already explained to you, the activity only grows with time and it will continue growing indefinitely, getting the catalyst better and better. If we remove all of them, if we deposit the catalyst up to probably this point of six hours and remove all of the precursors, that's what will happen. It will not lose all of its activity, but it will lose quite a bit, more than 100 millivolt, and this is significant. So always keep in mind the logarithmic dependence between current and potential. And if you see a degradation in the activity of 50 millivolt, do never say, oh, it's just a minor degradation. Most likely you've lost more than half of your activity. And here it's 100 millivolt of their degradation, so it's even higher loss. So what we've done next, we've left cobalt only in the electrolyte solution. And as you can see, after the deposition for approximately six hours, 
and keeping the electrode operating with a cobalt 2 plus protein solution only, the stability turned out to be unchanged. So we've applied a range of techniques, including uh, in situ, ex situ, hot and soft excess to demonstrate that the catalyst actually remains intact when we just operate it with a cobalt in the solution. It was a quite a surprising finding for us because the mechanism for the stabilization of the lead oxide and iron species under these conditions is not really clear. So what we've done further, we decreased the cobalt concentration by a factor of 100 and even 1,000, but these data, the best data were obtained in this concentration, the most comprehensive analysis, and demonstrated that the catalyst still behaves quite stably. It can be heated up to 80 degrees without losing activity. Their current potential dependencies still follow the expected butler Faulkner behavior with nice linear dependencies. So the activation energy is quite similar to that of their other water oxidation catalysts like iridium oxide and cobalt oxide. So overall, the conclusion was that the catalyst really enjoys itself under these conditions, even without other precursors being added. We pushed it further, deposited it for, on different substrates, increased the temperature and demonstrated the operation for more than a week, increased the current density, still remained active. So overall, what has been done, we've proven that this system can operate via the cobalt selective self-healing mechanism only. And of course, the final step was to actually demonstrate is our initial observation of platinum being not affected by the cobalt 2 plus actually true? So to do so, we've just run this um, quite a crude test experiment with the two electrodes seated in the same compartment to make sure that if platinum wants to be poisoned by the, <coughs> excuse me, the, lead ox the cobalt iron lead oxide catalyst, it will have a lot of chances to do so. And then we run it for two weeks at 100 milliamps per centimeter square and nothing, nothing really happened. Even at 80 degrees, the potential of the anode was stable at the level we expected to be, and the potential of the cathode was also quite stable at approximately 20, 30 millivolts over potential as would platinum one carbon catalysts do at this 100 milliamps per centimeter square. So if we would remove cobalt iron lead catalyst from the anode and just use a, use a bare platinized system, it would die in a matter of just one day. So this was a quite impressive and finding with which we were very, very happy. But I want to emphasize that this experiment is, of course, not a real water splitting experiment because the gas is intermixed. We are confident that there is no uh, interaction of the oxygen with the cathode at these current densities because it's just physically impossible according to the fixed laws. But still, this is not a real electrolyzer, and that's what we are currently working on, integrating the system into the real electrolyzer and hoping to improve the activity even further. So at this point, I'll, I'll stop talking about lead because nobody likes lead. It's toxic and we need to decrease the use of it around us. That's what everyone, every perovskite solar cell person tell you to do. And we were also trying to find alternatives for lead, notwithstanding all of its amazing electrochemical properties. And if one thinks of an alternative to lead in the periodic table, the first emitted guess would be this mode. And it, it can be concluded from a variety of their similarities in their chemical properties and in traditional chemistry and heterogeneous analysis field of, you will always, you will often find that lead, if lead oxide has been used before, the first thing the researchers tried to use to replace it would be bismuth. And <clears throat> in our case, the most important was the similarity of their orbit diagram. As you can see, they're qualitatively very similar, suggesting that if we can make lead operate in there as a highly acid-stable conductive matrix solar catalyst, there might be possibility to do the same with bismuth, all the potentials required to produce bismuth oxide according to the thermodynamics that we have posited. So nevertheless, we dived into this uh, uh, adventure and tried to electrodeposit bismuth together with cobalt as well as with other transition metals, but cobalt worked best again. In this case, we had to apply different conditions because bismuth was a bit less, a bit more challenging to electrodeposit. But nevertheless, we achieved some deposition of the film on the electrode surface and then put it into the solution where no precursors were added, just your sulfuric acid solution. And we observed quite a weird behavior. So we started off with a very positive potential, like two and a half volt, and we were discouraged by that thought, okay, nothing works. But then we were quite patient enough to wait for a couple of hours. And what we observed was that the potential was progressively decreasing 
over the two hours quite rapidly, and then was operating stably and further improving and improving with time over the two hours or even over the two days or even longer time scale. And in parallel with that, we observed that the intensity of the coloration of the electrodes, so shown here as the UV spectrum and also shown here as the photographs of the electrode, continuously intensified. So we concluded that <clears throat> this mode is progressively oxidized during this process and the electrode is actually roughened. We also observed that the uh, very unexpectedly that the tin from the tin oxide, fluorine doped tin oxide electrode actually gets dissolved under these conditions, enters into the catalyst and makes it more stable. And then we challenged the material even further. So we undertook the on off experiment and run it for more than a week again, as you can see here. And the activity was again found to improve further and further. And eventually it was actually approaching that we observed for the cobalt iron lead system, not as active as the latter, but still closely approaching that. And the most important aspect here is that the amount of cobalt immobilized onto these bismuth cobalt electrodes was actually more than 10 times lower than that in the cobalt iron lead system, meaning that the specific activity of cobalt was actually quite high. The problem was that we did not really succeed in pushing it higher and that a real activity for the geometric surface area of the electrode remained still not high enough. Therefore, we thought if we cannot stabilize cobalt within the bismuth matrix, probably we should take something that can be stabilized on its own at positive potentials under acidic conditions. And at the same time, being catalytically active for the oxygen evolution reaction and among the possibilities, except for iridium, the one which attracted us, our attention was silver. So here you can uh, see the combined silver bismuth cobalt diagram, which is color coded according to the stability of the compounds formed. And the blue, blue area represents the stability of the silver bismuth oxide mixed system. And as you can see, it is quite stable in the area we need to operate it. So we dived into this adventure again and tried to test how silver and bismuth would behave together in the electrochemical environment under the water oxidation conditions. When we took just bismuth 3 plus solution, we expected to observe essentially no catalytic activity in the cycle voltammetry. When we put silver into it, we observed the increase in the currents. The activity was there, but not as good as we wanted. But most excitingly, when we mixed silver and bismuth, we got it a significant improvement in activity. And again, similar to the cobalt and lead, the performance in the backward cycle was much higher than in the forward one, meaning that the catalyst was continuously produced on the electrode surface and improving in the activity, which was, of course, further confirmed in the steady state experiments. This dark blue curve demonstrates how it improves the activity. But most importantly, again, when we removed all the precursors from the solution, this system just remained stable. So this light blue curve demonstrates that it's just stable in few sulfuric acid with absolutely no precursor added, in contrast to the cobalt 2 plus precursor we had to add into the other system. Before and after, <clears throat> electrode looked approximately the same, same very dark uh, colored coating. And then we ran it for more than a week again super stable and highly reproducible and we also had a look of course we were curious what's actually happened into the electrolyte solution and we analyzed it and we found that initially there was of course no silver and bismuth in the solution but after a couple of uh, hours of operation there was some dissolved but this amount was very very low and uh, remained constant after the two hours so the equilibrium between the solid and dissolved species established quite rapidly. And that's why I have this no in the inverse commas and quotes in the heading, because it's impossible to have no dissolved precursors. Any catalyst will dissolve, as was shown for iridium, as we showed for the cobalt and lead, and as we are showing here for the silver bismuth oxide. So there is always an equilibrium between the solid and dissolved species, and the status of this equilibrium always strongly depends on the temperature and the pH. So activity was still neat, not super high. So what we try to do, we try to apply just a regular trick of all electrocatalysis researchers. Let's just take a high surface air electrode and put our catalyst on top. So nothing fancy here, but still worth trying. And what we've done, we took this nice platinized titanium felt and increased the temperature. 
and by doing so, we've pushed the activity by more than 200 millivolts as compared to the flat electrode and increasing the temperature also provided this improvement shown on this graph. And most importantly, again, the system was stable, operating at 100 milliamps per centimeter squared, 80 degrees in the half molar sulfuric acid without loss of any activity. Moving forward, another matrix which we are very, very curious and which is also known from the DSA fields and from the electrovinian is antimony, but it was not investigated for really intensively. And we were quite curious about it because antimony oxides present actually the most perfect combination of the properties required for us. They're perfectly stable, electrically conductive, and can be synthesized in high surface area. We initially thought that we can electrodeposit them, and we indeed succeeded in doing so, but their performance was not that great. To our surprise, we still don't understand why. Therefore, we came up with a quite a simple uh, chemical synthesis solution uh, um, approach where we just preheated the solutions, drop casted them onto the <clears throat> electrode substrate, and then heat it under the quiet temperature. And we were able to obtain this mixed manganese antimony, cobalt antimony, and ruthenium antimony catalyst coatings, which we characterized again using all the, with, all the methods available to us. And we've concluded that in the case of the cobalt antimony material, we produce actually the target cobalt antimonate phase with this beautiful trirotile structure. And uh, in the case of the manganese, the structure was not that well defined. Quite a few manganese antimony bonds were missing, but still the manganese antimonate phase was most likely present there. And in both cases, there were admixtures of the individual metal oxides, which were, however, removed after the oxygen evolution reaction test quite quickly. Most, much more pecu peculiar outcome was found in the case of ruthenium. We failed to find any evidence for the formation of the ruthenium antimonate, and the only thing we found was this very nice nanocomposite of highly dispersed ruthenium particles caught it with the particles of antimony oxide. And that's how it looks under the STM EDS mapping. You can see that they're really mixed at the nanoscale, and they remain essentially unchanged after the oxygen evolution reaction, except for the removal of a bit of excessive antimony oxide. So talking about the oxygen evolution reaction test, that's how they look. So this is just a one day test at the constant current density with a super low catalyst loading on the electrode surface. The cobalt was now found not to be the best one in contrast to all the previous our attempts. So it turned out that manganese is actually better now. And most excitingly, ruthenium was amazingly good and most importantly, was absolutely stable. So this is the first other time I saw ruthenium water oxidation catalyst improving in activity in operation rather than losing it. Iridium oxide, similar as, as consistent with our benchmarking studies, was not super stable, but under these mild conditions, it lost only a bit of its activity. So again, we of course analyzed the amount of their materials dissolved, and uh, it was found to be quite significant for the cobalt and manganese, but majorly associated with the dissolution of the individual oxides, which I mentioned before. And if we follow the temporal evolution of the dissolution, you can see that the major um, significant part dissolves over the initial eight or 12 hours, where we have the um, monometallic manganese oxides present, but then the dissolution essentially stops. And in the case of ruthenium, it actually just stops immediately after four hours at very low, at, at very low levels. So the performance and stability are really impressive. So then again, we push the catalyst to the real conditions, 80 degrees, and both of them again demonstrated that they can operate on these conditions. The manganese all degraded after four days of operation, Although still it was not that bad for an iridium free catalyst. I never saw any catalyst except for the cobalt and lead, the self healing one, operating for that long without any iridium added. But much more impressive was the performance of the ruthenium one, which again, even at 80 degrees, lost a bit of the catalyst in the beginning, but then it remained essentially stable with a huge S numbers and the stability for one, more than one week and half molar sulfuric acid at. Um, uh, very tiny loading on the catalyst surface. So, and if we calculate the S number here, it was even higher, much higher than for the best iridium oxide catalyst, which was a very nice outcome for us. So, I think this is the final slide. Yes. And I hope I made it within the 30 minutes, as I promised, probably a bit longer. So, 
you know, that's that's pretty much the summary of what we are doing in the acidic water electrolysis domain in the moment. So the catalyst in matrix approach is very versatile, universal. You can produce a lot of exciting catalysts with it. And um, I think I've made it, uh, I tried to make throughout my talk the points how important it is to pay attention to carefully characterizing materials using the right techniques and really measuring the activity right, focusing on the steady state performance rather than measuring quickly the transient result and being very, very happy with it. All right, I'll stop there then. Thank you so much, Sasha. I think close to the 30 minutes line. So thank you very much. But uh, it was really interesting uh, discussion and uh, specifically the design strategies and some of the lessons that you have mentioned, which I'll touch base on that, uh, some of those sort of insights you can provide to the students later on. But before that, perhaps I can uh, first uh, go through a couple of the questions we have in the chat and before opening the floor for maybe five minutes uh, for asking questions. So one of the question, uh, and this is from Rose, is uh, cobalt is considered as a critical mineral. So is there any other element that you reckon can be used to replace cobalt to enhance the stability? Yes, Rose, perfect question. Um, and hard one, <laughs> as, you, as you can judge from, from the size from my side. So, of, we would, of course, prefer to use the manganese, which is uh, more accessible and um, less toxic, less critical. But under some circumstances, manganese just refuses to work and tends to produce them, in, well, not insulating, but catalytically less, way less active um, uh, oxides in the high oxidation state. So it seems like there is something very special about cobalt. The good thing is that if we make it work right, we will not need that large amounts as required for the battery field. Therefore, I agree with you. This is the issue which we, of course, need to address. And never, never forget about it. But if we are in the situation where the choice is whether we are using iridium or cobalt, I think the answer would be let's, let's try to go ahead with cobalt and try to minimize its con con amounts, for example, by combining it with manganese. All right, thank you, Sasha. Uh, Kamran has a question. So it's on, is there a time limit to the performance of the bismuth uh, uh, AG mix? So will the stability decline at some point? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. We were absolutely surprised by the behavior of this system. I was actually super skeptical when I was suggesting Darcy the PhD outstanding PhD student who've done this work, I was suggesting Darcy, okay, let's take it out of the precursor solution and just see how fast it dies. We were confident that it will die within a matter of hours. So, but this system just amazed us. It remained stable and uh, we operated it at, um, as, as I demonstrated, quite high current densities. We never observed the degradation. So the only way it can degrade is if this tiny concentration, the nanomolar level concentration, as I showed you, from the electrolyte solution will be lost in some way. And there are, of course, mechanisms in the electrolyzer for this to happen. That's why most of the anode catalysts have these limitations. And this needs to be actually taken into account when an electrolyzer is designed. Even the iridium one, all the redeposition of iridium on the platinum surface is not that horrible. Iridium is still a potent hydrogen evolution catalyst. It's still not good either. It kills the membrane. It still decreases the performance. And there is a work which demonstrates the, <clears throat> the, the um, damaging outcomes of this uh, anode catalyst degradation on the cathode and on the membrane. This is quite well understood in the electrolyzer domain, both membrane-based and the traditional diaphragm-based alkaline system. All right, thank you, Sasha. Uh, another question coming up in the chat is that what mechanism is changed for the ruthenium sites in the antimony ruthenium mix to experience the improvement in stability? Yeah, that's, that's, that's what, <laughs> that was another amazing result which we never expected. When we were trying to do XAS, well, not trying, we were just doing XAS on this material and we record the first Zane's data set we look at it and think, okay, most likely we just mi mix the samples. It should be just ruthenium oxide uh, benchmark. Sorry, the, the, the reference material. 
we threw away the sample, prepared a new one, and we observed exactly the same routine what to response, and we couldn't understand what's actually happening. And that's where the TEM helped us. So we also, if you go, if you have a look at the paper, there is, yeah, of course, what I've shown was probably, I don't know, one percent of the results. So we've done a lot of um, theoretical work thanks to our um, wonderful colleagues from IATB and Bombay, uh, I, IAT Bombay, who've um, undertaken their analysis of the stability of different ruthenium antimony phases and uh, actually found out that the formation of the ruthenium antimony is highly improbable. And the only way we can combine the two is the mild doping of antimony into ruthenium oxide or ruthenium into the antimony oxide. So this is consistent with our experimental observations, although I need to acknowledge that we did not get an experimental proof of this minor doping happening, simply because it's most likely experimentally impossible with the techniques currently available to us. But yeah, the, the, the chemistry does explain why the mechanism changed. If the cobalt and manganese are thermodynamically capable of producing antimonates, so cobalt has B2O6, for example, ruthenium, just doesn't like doing this thermodynamically. And that's why the mechanism of the catalyst formation changes. Following on the mechanism of the stability improvement, that was probably the most amazing outcome that these thin coatings of antimony oxide do protect ruthenium oxide from the solution. That, that was a very interesting find. The next okay. challenge is to synthesize it in the powder form so it can be integrated to the electrolyzer. That's what we are currently attempting to do. All right, thanks, Sasha. Uh, we look forward to those results once, the, maybe perhaps in a future talk. Uh, one of the questions uh, coming from Weiran is that uh, as the reaction is continuing, um, are you observing any phase change of this sort of material? Is the doping of other atoms uh, site selective, for, for instance, bismuth oxide? <clears throat> yeah, it depends on the system, but generally, no. Generally, no. So, cobalt iron lead, our favorite, our our father of all our work in this, you know, in all this domain is an absolutely rock solid stable material. So we've done in situ XAS and what we observed is that cobalt in the lead matrix has much more capabilities to be oxidized to the high oxidation state, something like cobalt four plus delta. Not, 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 not really higher than, not, not five plus, I cannot imagine it can exist, but something higher than we would normally observe. Similar for silver, all the silver three plus oxides are very well known. We've done in situ XAS on this, and this paper is currently under review, and hopefully will get the, will be out soon because the review reports were surprisingly very nice on this occasion. Um, we also observed that combination with the bismuth matrix facilitates further oxidation of the catalytic elements. So talking about the global phase change, I don't think this occurs, but another new role, which we previously didn't realize of the matrix is that it allows the catalyst when it's integrated with this environment to adopt high oxidation states easier. So it enriches electrochemistry of the catalytic material and therefore makes it more efficient for activating of water. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, Sasha, uh, maybe perhaps uh, one of the things, uh, all this, most of the questions are all on the, you know, the research, the wonderful research you have done, maybe in the interest of time, I'm just shifting gear a little bit. Uh, some of the lessons that you have learned, uh, for instance, one of the things you're mentioning is that, for instance, you know, we're, uh, and you've seen it in a lot of paper, and you and I had a lot of conversation on this, is that people talking about transient measurement and showing that as the best performance for catalyst. So what are the lessons you would like to impart or some of the do's and the don'ts for our electrochemical, uh, electrochemist researchers in the training center to do? Uh, for instance, yeah, I've seen in some of your paper... Yeah, uh, the LSV error bar. So what are the things that you can perhaps give us a bit of guidance? Yeah, perf perfect point, Dan. Yeah, you can see from our papers how, you, you might probably see from our papers how things evolved even in, in the way we are doing things. So if you have a look at my paper, I don't know, one of my papers published five years, well, probably not five, seven or more years ago, I would be quite ashamed of the way I reported the data there because I didn't report the proper reproducibility where I should have probably reproduced only one key experiment, but didn't reproduce all others. So the major message which I want to convey to the younger 
part of our team. Please don't be ever lazy with confirming the reliability of your experiments. This is very important in the first place for your own sakes, that you're confident in what you're doing. So it's not sufficient to demonstrate one hero experiment and then put it out there. It needs to be reproduced. So for example, if you had a look at this, um, uh, one of the slides where I was showing the performance of, for example, this one. So this is on the left-hand side, left bottom. I hope you can see it. It's not just a line. There is something around this line. And, an ex and someone might think, oh, it's just the experimental noise. No, it's not noise. It's the standard deviation calculated for three repeats of this experiment. So, and these experiments are week long. So given the importance of this result, we were not comfortable with just reporting one week long experiment. We had to take three week long experiments and we report the data as mean plus minus standard deviation. So when we've done that, we were really confident that the, this very unexpected behavior of this catalyst is actually true. And uh, you might be surprised by how frequently this is not the case. So there is, might be a one-off wonderful experiment where everything works perfect, but then you try to reproduce it and it never works as good as it did in the first instance. And this is not the end of the world. This is the part of the science. That's how we should address all our problems. We need to make sure that we're addressing them reliably and we're applying the correct techniques. So we always achieve the quasi steady state performance. Then we torture our catalyst for as long as we need for hours, depending on the system, days, weeks, and then we'll produce this again. So probably one very stupid and unexpected advice I can give to um, the younger part of our cohort. Since all of us have phones with us, don't ever forget to take photographs of your electrodes and your steps. This is what I've learned a lot of the last three years. So for example, now, well, for example, we're publishing this Silva or Bismuth uh, work and one of the questions from the reviewers actually suggests to do the reproduction of uh, one of the longer experiments. And it would be much simpler to answer these questions if you would have a photograph of this electrode. And Darcy just forgot, the PhD student just forgot to take it. So you would find it very, very useful if you take photographs of your setup all the time. And when you someday notice that the experiment is probably behaving strangely not as the others, you can have a look at these photographs and find out, oh, actually there was a bubble sitting on the electrical surface. That's why the performance is better, worse. So yeah, this is probably absolutely unrelated, but I just want to emphasize, this is very obvious, but very frequently overlooked trick. Thank you so much, Sasha. I think the insights and the tips that you have provided that would be very useful uh, for everybody's, uh, uh, you know, uh, knowledge. So the recording would be available, so you can find out. There was a question about one of the DOI number for one of the papers, so those can be found through that recording. So thank you so much, Sasha. Uh, please, I uh, would like to take the opportunity to thank Sasha on behalf of everybody, uh, on behalf of the training center. Uh, this was very useful, and uh, we have learned a lot. I personally have learned a lot, and uh, look forward to working a lot closer with Sasha. Sasha. So before yeah, thank we thank you very much for up, having me here. It was a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you. Before we wrap up, maybe I just let you, letting you all know that our next uh, presenter in August webinar would be Jeremy Stone from J Power, and he would be presenting on the HESC project, so which is the hydrogen energy supply chain project, uh, which is based in Victoria, uh, looking into exporting or Australia's only exporting facility right now. Uh, to Japan. So that will be on the 26th of August from 12 to 1 p.m. And if you need more information, please uh, refer back to our website. But in that note, perhaps uh, three minutes uh, before maybe the ending of the time. So thank you all for uh, coming in today. <laughs>